All right, let's uh, let's keep going with Shear here. Um, so, what we did there first on this one was we found well, this was on Friday. This is we were finishing up. We found the shear strain. So what we got here, we got this bolt shearing device that's got a bit too much slack between the two uh, sides of it. So it's got 0.15 centimeters there of a gap. And that gets a little bit of offset in there. And then we push down with, uh, I think it's 3,000 newtons. And we get the bolt to go into this pattern shown right there. There's a zoom in on the pattern. So essentially what's happening here is the thing is starting out as kind of a rectangle like that. And then there's a load applied. And then what happens is it deforms. And, you know, whenever you apply loads, things deform. And so to greatly exaggerate what it might do, it ends up looking like that. That's the idea, okay? So now we got that load pushing down like so, and the thing looks different now. It, it's, it's not a rectangle anymore. It's more of a parallelogram kind of thing. And then you've got the dimensions for that over here. So what happened was it deformed, which is delta, by 0 0.00012, and that original length across was 0.15 centimeters. And you could convert that into uh, meters or not. You know, as long as the units on the top and bottom are the same, you're fine there. So I just converted to meters. So I got 0.00012 meters divided by 0 0.0015 and come up with the shear strain right there. Okay. So, are we okay with that? So that's the first thing we want to find there is the shear strain in the bolt. Okay. All right, now what we also want to know here is the shear modulus for the bolt. Now, what the shear modulus is, which which letter is that? You all remember? That's G, yeah. And what G equals is tau, which is the shear stress over gamma, which is the shear strain, okay? So if we want to find G, we got to find tau, because we already got gamma. So what tau is, is V over A. V is the shear force and A is the area. So the next thing to do here is to find A, and that's the cross-sectional area of the bolt. And that one I would want in meters, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just taking the area of the bolt. It's pi r squared. So the... Uh, The thickness of the bolt there is a uh, one centimeter, I think. So half of that is 0 0.005 meters. Square that and multiply it by pi, and you get the uh, area of the bolt. Okay. So there's the bolt diameter right there. All right, so now we got the area of the bolt, and we can get the shear stress. Okay, and this is V over A, so you just take that load that's applied, which is 3,000 newtons, and you divide it by that area. And I do want that in meters. I've got meters to the four. I'm thinking moment of inertia there, but I think I want meters squared. So that's um, 7.85 times 10 to the six. Oh, and I did that twice. Look at that. Should be squared. Yeah, it should be meters squared. It's an area. So take 3,000, divide it by 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. That's the area. Divide it out, and you get the shear stress, 38.2 times 10 to the 6. And that would be newtons per square meter. That's the stress. So that's 38.2 megapascals. Okay.
Everybody okay with that? And then once you've got that, to find G, that's the shear modulus. Modulus is stress over strain. Modulus tells you how much stress you have to apply to get a given strain. Kind of how stretchy or, you know, how, how stretchy the material is or ductile. I don't know. There's different words you could use for it. Might get a little bit more technical than stretchy, so maybe ductile would be the word. Okay. So the higher the modulus, the less the material will deform. Now, it's not a measure of strength. It's a measure of how much it deforms. Okay? So keep that, that in mind. You know, some materials that are very, uh, have a very high modulus are brittle, and they'll fracture pretty quick. You know, cast iron comes to mind. Glass, things like that. They don't deform much, but it doesn't mean they're extra strong. All right, so G is tau over gamma, and you know, get ready to use some uh, scientific notation when you get into G because it's usually a very large number. In this case, it's 48.7 times 10 to the 9 newtons per meter squared. So, if we plot up a graph of stress versus strain, you'd have a similar relationship to what you get for normal stress and strain. Probably not as much of a, a yielding type phenomena though, so you might get something like that. Okay, so if you looked at G, what, what, what is G on that graph? Yeah, G is the slope, okay? And I keep asking all these little questions because, you know, I just want you to be thinking about this and processing it and learning it because you want to get a feeling for what these things are. G is the slope of that straight line is what it is. Okay. So notice it doesn't tell you how high the line goes, which would be the strength. It just tells you the relationship between the stress you apply and how much strain you've got, which isn't always indicative of strength. So when you build structural stuff like a bridge or a building, do you want a, a ductile steel, which is stretchy, or do you want a more brittle steel like cast iron? Do you suppose? What's that? For structure? Yeah, structure. Yeah. Ductile? Yeah, ductile is what you want. A few reasons. First thing is cast iron just shatters. I mean, if you take a sledgehammer and whack a cast iron stove, you could crack it, you know. Um, so that type of brittle failure is uh, dangerous. I mean, there's a few things wrong with it. The first thing is there's no warning it's going to occur. You just have nothing, 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 that bang, just fracture. Whereas a ductile material, you'll see it actually deform before it fails. The other thing is a ductile material can absorb more energy before it fails. The stretching absorbs energy. So, so uh, structural steel is a mild steel. Now, you all know what steel is? What goes into steel? Carbon and iron. Yeah, iron and carbon. The car what, what you get, the, the, the iron makes kind of a lattice, kind of a, a crystalline type structure, a loose kind of crystal. The carbon fits into the spaces on the lattice and makes it more rigid. As you add more and more carbon, the material gets more and more rigid. So cast iron has a high carbon content. A milder steel has less carbon. The more voids you have, the less carbon, the more able the material is to stretch and to form. It's got more room to kind of slide. More open why, spaces. Is that why a cast iron is black? I'm not sure. It might be. I, I don't know well enough to say, but it could be. Some cast iron is gray. I've seen gray cast iron too. So yeah, I don't know. Okay. So um, okay. So remember, when you've got uh, ductility going on, when you have that yield phenomena happening, what's happening? Those atoms are sliding. They're moving around, and things are just kind of stretching and moving within the crystal. Okay. All right. All right, um, so we good with all this, kind of going through that stuff for uh, for shear? And, and notice, you do the same thing for shear and for normal stress. You go, you know, if you got delta, you can get strain. If you got strain 
And if you got the load in the area, you can get the stress, and you put them together and get the modulus. That's kind of the sequence we're going through there, okay? All right. I also asked you for E on this, and this is just a little formula that's kind of handy to know if you if you got two of the properties but not the third, you can plug the two into that formula there and get the third. So we get G and nu, we can plug them in and find E. And that's over on the upper left of your formula sheet. I don't know if I've got a formula sheet with me, but it's if I had to guess, I'd say formula number nine would be my guess. I don't know, but it might be it. Is that it? Okay, so that's just, you know, that formula is just if you happen to only have two of the properties, you can derive the third. Keep in mind that nu, that's that Poisson's ratio, which relates to lateral strain. That's usually for metals between 0.2 and 0.4, are normal values for that. Okay. So why don't we have a look at uh, 200, if we're good with that. So this is a kind of a review problem, um, not you know, this one's pretty straight up, I guess. But, you know, I, I want you to be able to put this stuff together. Let's, uh, now the first thing I'm going to have you do, I'm going to get you some homework uh, today that's going to be a property review. So I'm going to get you a sheet like that. It just has the different variables on the left, then it has the pronunciation, what is it, and a formula. So I'll have you fill that out for Wednesday, okay? I've got copies of it here, and... Uh, for those of you online, it's in the, it's in Moodle, okay, under the homework handouts. I think it's called terminology or something like that. Okay, so so we'll do that, and that's just to help you kind of review these properties and just know what they are. Okay, and like I say, be working on these. You know, just just every now and again, every evening or something, just take three minutes and look them over, get them in your head, work with them a little bit, because. You know, you, you just want to know when I start talking about delta, when I start talking about sigma, you should know what they mean. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at this one here. This is 200. Just label each one of those. One of those is shear, and the other one is normal or axial, either one. And I don't want to hear an answer on this from anybody. I just want everybody to look at it and fill in those labels where it says which one's which. Okay. So one is shear and the other one is normal or axial. So why don't you get those filled in first. Kind of keep in mind what they are, you know. Okay, so when I think of normal stress, I think of spring <coughs> stretching out or being compressed. So I think of a spring like uh, spring, I guess. Um, shock absorbers tend to be, for the most part, compressed, I think. Although they don't really have shock absorbers anymore, do they? <laughs> One of the problems with that was shock absorbers only cost 30 bucks. That was a good work. I'm sure struts work a lot better than just being facetious. Okay. So, what do we got here? On the left, what's that? What do we got? That's axial, right? Because you're stretching. Maybe a better a way to think about axial is think of an accordion. Right? Pull it and push it. We have any accordion players here? Maybe it's not great. Button box or keyboard or okay. keyboard. keyboard. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so that's axial or normal. And then I, when I think of uh, shear, what I think of is like a deck of cards that's being tipped over, and each card is sliding one across the other. So this one, you know, by default there, that's shear. All right. Now let's find the properties there. So what we want to do for each one of these is find stress, strain, and deformation. Now there's a key to doing this, and the key is to figure out what the area is and what the length is. The area is what's attached. And in our little sketches there, we use those hatch marks to indicate what's attached. The length makes up, is, is perpendicular to the side that, that uh, to, to the area that's attached. So the length is normal to the area. So the length is the side that is not attached. So one way I remember this is between the area and the length, you take up the three dimensions, all three of them. So once you calculate the area and length for both of these cases, just look and see what's attached, that's the area, and you figure out what the length is, and that's normal to the area. Yeah. So by attached, you just mean on that plane? Yeah, right. The area of the plane, I guess, it's attached to the surface. In this case, well, we got one surface as a floor, the other one's a wall. That's so like whatever you glue to the wall or the floor. Okay. And that's just my way of remembering this. So the area is what's attached. The uh, length is the dimension that is not attached. So between the two, they take up all three dimensions. So just look at what's attached, multiply the dimensions together, that's the area. Look at what isn't, write that down, and that's the length. Okay. So I have to start with that. Okay with those? 0 0.06, 0 0.4, 0 0.08, 0 0.3. We're good? Okay. So I just got what's attached and then the dimension that isn't. So um, we'll put the dimension that isn't in a red squiggly line. If I can get this dang thing to come up here. Here it is. Okay. Good. So between the two, you get all three dimensions. You kind of define the box. Okay, now go ahead and find the, let's start with the normal stress case. Let's find the stress and the strain and uh, deformation. Okay. So find the stress first. And notice I'm not giving you the symbols out of the formula sheet. I mean, that's typically how the homework goes and how the tests go. I don't say find E or something. I say find the modulus of, of elasticity. You know, I don't say find the find sigma. I say find the stress. So it's kind of on you to, to get this stuff figured out, okay? 
And yeah, formula sheet, upper left hand corner, formulas one through about eight or seven even, or six actually. We're up in there, okay? So upper left hand corner, one through six. If you have questions, you know, let me know. Let somebody know. See if I can't pause the recording. So at least get to the stress if you're on the recording. We'll uh, go over this stuff as we get through it here, but I'll probably pause it here for a second. stress here. I'm going to find the stupid thing. Here it is. Thirteen point three. Y'all get to that? Thirteen three. Questions? You know, just take the load over the area. Okay. Green next. So you might have to think about this a little bit. How do you get from that stress to the strain? You know. You're not given any deformation information directly. Yeah, right. You got a modulus, though. Okay, so that's that's how you're going to get from stress to strain on that. Okay, so obviously you got to use what you got to uh, to accomplish what you need there. Okay. All right, so why don't you give that a run just and see if it come up with the strain. And then once you got the strain, get to the delta. So the strain here, what we're doing there is we're, we've got E is defined as sigma over epsilon. Well, what the strain is, is epsilon. So that'll be sigma times E. So we got sigma, and I'm going to run out of room here. So we got sigma, and that's 13.3 times 10 to the 6. And then we multiply it by the modulus, which we're given, and that's 20 times 10 to the 9. That's unitless there, the strain. No, that's stress. That's newtons per meter squared. Oh, I'm sorry, you divide it by the modulus. There we go. Divide it, and that's uh, 20 times 10 to the 9. So we're going to divide that. And what we're going to come up with then 
is uh, 0 0.000667. Okay, so that's the strain. Okay. And then the last thing is to find delta. Now there's just a real basic formula for delta there that you can use. Okay, so what you've got there is the strain. So based on that, you should be able to work your way into delta. Okay. And just look at the basic definition of strain and rearrange the equation. So see, delta is the lengthening of, the, of that block. It won't be 0.4 meters after this load is applied. It'll be a bit longer. That's what delta is. So you found the strain by using the modulus, you know, and so now you can figure out how much longer it's going to be. All right, so we can get to delta here, just multiply it by the length, okay? That's how you get to delta. So the delta is epsilon times L, L is 0.4 meters. So if I just spend a little bit of time off the bat and figure out uh, A and L, I can just go ahead and run through these pretty readily. Okay. Yeah, question? For epsilon, they, they would be in the same units? Yes, because what epsilon is is a ratio of that. It doesn't matter what units they are, but they've got to be the same. So omega Pascal is equivalent to Newton meter squared? Oh, okay, good point. Um, it probably, I mean, if you knew what those units meant, it would work out, but probably the best way to have done this would have been times 10 to the 6. That would, yeah, that's, that would have been a little less confusing. Yeah, they should be the same. Yeah, but yeah, they should have been the same. Okay. So when you're doing strain, the units on top and bottom should be the same. All right, everybody okay with that? So we get to that all right? Okay. Now how about the other side? How about doing the shear? See, it's the exact same process. It's just that it's, it's oriented differently. But, but if you just think in terms of area and length, really it's the same process. So that's why I like to use that approach to it. The area is what's attached. The length is the dimension that is not attached between the area and the length. You get uh, all three dimensions. So if you just think in terms of area and length, you just do the same thing. Load over area is stress. Um, epsilon is stress over the modulus. And then delta is the, or excuse me, the strain is the stress over the modulus. And then delta is the strain times the length. Okay, that's how it'll work for the shear. Okay. So that's just real basic kind of stuff there. It's um, you know, we're, we're just doing um, kind of walking through these different properties. I just want you to have them kind of figured out as I'm doing this, okay? So we get on the point zero 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 two six seven meters for delta. Doing all right, okay. Good. All right. And then just do the same business here for the shear. So area is 0 0.08, length is 0 0.3 for the shear, because the 0.08 is what's attached there, that's hatched in over there. And then the length is the third dimension. So the area is 0 0.2 by 0 0.4, it's 0 0.08. And the length is 0 0.3. Take the load over the area, you'll get the stress. Okay.
So stress 7.5 megapascals, force over area. And the deformation there, so that whole thing's going to slide up. It's going to turn into a parallelogram shape. So the strain is kind of hard to see. Now the labeling's a little tough on this because I've got other stuff in the way, but there's the strain right there. It's the, kind of that angular deformation as it slides up one card across the next, if that were a deck of cards. And there's delta. Okay. So you get the area that's attached and the length. Start with the shear stress, the load over the area. Okay, we're good. And then from there, get to the um, strain next. You use the modulus to do that. Okay. So G is tau over gamma. Tau is the shear stress. And so you're going to work your way into gamma, which is the strain is tau over G. You all okay on gamma? Any questions on that? So once you got gamma, that's the shear strain, you can get to the delta. Right, so that's the basic steps there. In this example here, working through this stuff. Again, just identify the area and the length and everything else that is kind of follow the formulas. Area is what's attached. The length is the third dimension that isn't attached. So delta is point zero 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 two eight one. Take gamma times the length. The length is point three, and you'll get uh, delta.
Okay. Okay, so we got load and area to stress. We've got the modulus where we get to strain, and then we got the length that gets us to delta. Okay, so that's how that goes. Right. Um, now there's kind of a shortcut sort of way to do this, especially with axial, because you often want to know how much something will deform. It's a very common thing to want to know. So there's a, you can combine these all these steps into one formula, and it's it's used fairly often to find axial deformation. Okay. And it's here on this next, I think it's the next page in your notes, I think. 210, I think. So what we have are those three basic relationships. And here they are. We use sigma as P over A. And then we used E is stress, which is sigma over strain, which is epsilon. And what we did, we solved that for the strain. It was the stress over the modulus, E. And then we had delta over L as epsilon, so delta, the deformation, is the strain, epsilon, times the length. So when we get into those three forms of those equations that I've circled, we can put them together, because delta is epsilon times L. Well, what epsilon is, is sigma, the stress over E. So the strain is sigma over E, so that goes in there. And then what sigma is, is P over A. So you can put P over A in for sigma, combine all that stuff, and you get delta is PL over AE. Okay, so delta is the load times the length divided by the area divided by E. And that's a, a very common formula, formula seven okay so that's used to find delta so rather than going through all this rigmarole here you know it's important that you understand the relationships but you don't need to do all that stuff every time if you just want delta and you know the load the area the length so the area and the length are just the dimensions of the whatever you're working with and then e the modulus you can get delta is pl over a e. common formula So if you go back to what we were just working on there, you can apply that, see, and, and you know, not go, if, you, if all you want is delta, you don't need to go through all those steps. You can just do this, okay? Delta is this PL over AE, and just do it that way. And it's, knowing delta is a, a pretty common thing to want to know. It, it's something that you, uh, you know, that, that you might want to know just for its own sake, or you use that sometimes in other applications to find other things. Okay, so P, 800,000, A is the area we calculated, 0.4, excuse me, L is 0.4, A is 0.06, which we calculated, and then E is 20 times 10 to the 9. Okay, so these just knock it out like that if all you want is delta. Okay. So are we okay with that? Okay. Now that's for axial stress. Okay. And it's very common, very common formula. Now, okay, now you could also go ahead and use this for shear stress. It's not nearly as common to want to do it for shear stress, but you could. See, there's, there's my little sketch there to show what we're talking about here. If we pull on a bar here, the delta, which would be the elongation, would be PL over AE. Now for shear, how's that formula going to change? What's delta going to be for shear? Would we still use P? We call it V, it's a load, whatever the heck you call it. I, don't, I honestly don't know why they use two different letters for that. They're both loads, okay. So V is a shear load. You're still gonna have a length that you're gonna use? I think so. An area? I think so. How about E, what's E gonna turn into? If we're doing shear, G, yeah. E's the modulus elasticity. G's the shear modulus. So for shear, you can go delta is VL over AG if you want. 
Now that's not a common formula. You're not going to find it in a formula sheet. It's not on the blue formula sheet you've got. It's not on the back of a book anywhere, but it's for shear deformation. And all you're doing is taking PL over AE and adapting it for shear. So P changes into V, which really doesn't mean much of anything. They're both loads. But the important one there is that E changes into G. You don't use the modulus elasticity, which for st stretching and compression, that's for normal and axial type loads. You use the, the shear modulus, G. So you've got to remember to do that, okay? So you could go ahead and use that approach on our example here as well, okay? And it would have worked just fine. Okay. And I don't have the numbers handy on that, but, uh, you know, um, there we go. We got that. We got that. So it'd be what? Delta is VL over AG. So delta would be the load, which is 600 times 10 to the 6. times the length, which is, I think is 0.3 meters, over the area, which is 0.08 meters squared, divided by G, 8 times 10 to the 9, like so. Okay, and that would get you the delta. Those will be due Wednesday also. Okay.